Father God, in the name of Jesus. We come to you today thanking you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. Father, we ask you today to guide us as we do every day. We ask you especially to guide the words into the hearts of the listeners today. We ask you to put my words in perfect harmony with your words today because we need you today. The message you've given us today, we need your help on it. Come on, Holy Spirit. Jesus. In Jesus' name, we ask you for this help. Satan, we rebuke you and all your evil spirits. Get out of this place. Get out of our minds and hearts and souls. In Jesus' name, flee in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God. We thank you for all your blessings in Jesus name we pray amen that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. I just read you Romans 10, 9 and 10. There are over 30,000 promises in the Bible. There are 8,810 direct promises from God to you. So you see, there is no reason for us to be Christians on defense are Christians of defense. We must be the Christians of attack. It has to do with wineskins and new wine. We must be Christians. We, we can't be the old time Christians that were always being attacked. We have to get on the attack now. We've got enough promises of God. We've got enough word in us if we have the word in us. Let me explain something to you to the best of my ability. I've got to talk about wine for a minute to do this. I know a lot of us feel that it's grape juice. But may I suggest to you, the Bible wasn't written to an American culture, so please listen, sailor. There was no refrigeration back in Jesus' day. They had a camel or a donkey in about 120 degree heat and a wineskin. It's not grape juice, folks. So watch, or this whole illustration doesn't mean a thing. Now, you've got to understand this or you'll miss the meaning He's trying to say new wine is high octane. It ferments, it moves, and it gives off a gas. And that wine skin begins to puff up. And if that wine skin isn't oiled, it will split wide open. And what's wrong with the body today 
A lot of us are filled with spiritual gas. The Holy Ghost is moving in a new way and it's high octane. New wine is differentiated into new wine in old wine. You see, wine is differentiated into new wine in old wine. Old wine is mellow. It has a better bouquet. It has a sweet smell. It's smooth. I'm using tasters' very words, wine tasters. It's smooth. It's comfortable. We're accustomed to it. It's aged. It's mature. It's predictable. It's familiar. It's sophisticated. You can name it and label it. Sounds familiar. I hope you catch the spiritual application. But new wine, a new visitation, it's unpredictable. It's strong. It's a bit sharp to the taste. It's a little extreme. It's not sophisticated. It's a bit fanatical. And it's very unfamiliar, highly unstable. Oh, say, can you... See, every new visitation of God fits that category. I hope I can help some of you today. Lord, be with us now. Help us in every way. Touch the boy that won't come to you. Touch the girl that's wrestling with problems. Touch the grandmother, the mother, the father, the grandfather today. Touch them with wisdom so they can explain to their children what you want them to know in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some of us, as Christians, definitely need an attitude adjustment. And let God do it for you. Let God do it for you. Don't pray and not feel that you've gotten your prayer answer and stop praying. Makes no sense. Keep praying. If it's in the will of God, God will give it to you. Let's uh, look at Samson for a minute. Samson possessed supernatural strength. Samson had the spirit of God. He slew a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. Now the Bible tells us that one can kill a thousand, two can put 10,000 in flight, three can move a hundred thousand, and four can kill a million. So you see, Satan has no business in our lives at all. We're kings, we are priests, we are Satan bruisers. We've got priestly rights, we've got legal rights, we've got covenant rights, we've got gospel rights, we've got S-O-N rights. Sure, the flesh keeps wanting to come back, but we're spiritual beings, and when you live in the spirit and not in the flesh, you must know that the flesh is dead. So the devil has no business in our lives at all. The flesh is dead. But how can you and I expect to have a winning supernatural power like Samson? How can you and I expect Expect to have a winning supernatural power like Abraham, Moses, Joshua, David, Daniel. How can you and I expect to have a winning supernatural power like Jesus if you just live like Jesus one day a week? Be honest with yourself. Accept yourself for the way you are. You have people that say, I'm gonna be so good today. 
I'm going to be a super saint today. And then you go to get in your car and you slam your finger in your car door and oh, ouch, God, oh, son of a, did I say that? Yeah, you said it. Why did you say it? Because your heart is unchanged yet. That's why you said it. Now, God wants us to accept ourselves the way we are, rotten and unchanged. God wants us to let him express his goodness and his righteousness in us through his Holy Spirit. God has shown me that the Holy Spirit does not intend to improve us or make us better and better the way I've heard it in a lot of churches. God intends to bring us to fullness of death and make us new. I've learned also that transformation of the inner man or the spirit man does not once and for all fully reform our flesh this side of physical death, but rather it slays the power to control us while clothing us with the righteousness of Jesus. Let me explain. You see, if man had ultimate perfection on this side of physical death, then man would rely on the dimensions of his own character instead of leaning on Jesus. In other words, man would start to trust in his own flesh instead of Jesus. Let me clarify that. Psychologists would mend our self-images so that we could have confidence in ourselves. Christ would slay all our fleshly self-confidence so that our only self-image becomes I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Listen, a self-image is something we build in which we falsely learn to trust. A self-image necessarily sets us into self-centered striving to live up to it, to make sure others see it, to make sure others reward it. We must defend it. We must build it. We must rebuild it. But a believer's identity is a gift, something God builds in us, not having to be seen, not having to be rewarded, not having to be defended. Secular teaching is primarily a teaching of knowledge from intellect to intellect. Christian teaching to Christians build a structure of knowledge and character. I found out there can be no such teachings in those hidden areas, in the believer where the heart has not been born anew or born again. Please hear today, it's very important that you understand the word heart, H-E-A-R-T, if you look at the center of the word, the spelling of the word, the word ear is there. That is, the heart is the ear of the spirit. The heart is what has got to die to the old self and be born anew. So you must plow the heart, breaking up stubborn clods of self-righteousness, weed out the old in mind. Weed out the old in mind and, and heart. Pluck up the seeds of the enemy and prepare the heart for the seed of faith so it may produce, produce good fruit. We must allow God to control our hearts. It must hurt God deeply that even in spirit-filled churches, sin so often runs through the church, many times among the leaders. 
You see, the work of the church may be complete in the minds of the people, but in the hearts from which evil comes, the plowing of the field remains untouched. You must let God change your heart to a new heart. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now that does not refer to physical sight. They shall see God. It means to come to know and comprehend his nature. In conversation we say, oh I see, when we really mean I understand. Jesus was saying that those whose hearts are purified come to understand and embrace God for who he actually is. The interference is that our hearts are not pure and we impute to God motives and ways which are not his. We do not see God, but only our projection of him. How many have heard people say, don't talk to me about a loving God. Why doesn't he stop all the wars? Why doesn't he stop men from dying? Why doesn't he stop men from killing? And sometime in the very name of religion, why does God do like this? Doesn't he care? I don't know if you've heard that or not. Oh, God, don't you care? Don't you care, God? How many people do you think have been there, my friends? A mother weeps over a stillborn child. God, don't you care? A husband is torn from his wife by a tragic traffic accident. God, don't you care? The tears of an eight-year-old fall on his daddy's casket and you hear the question. God, don't you care? Why me? Why my friend? Why my business? Why don't you care? It's the timeless question, the question asked by literally every person that has walked the earth. There's never been a president, a worker, or a businessman who hasn't asked it. There's never been a soul who doesn't wrestle with the aching question? Does my God care? Or is my pain God's great mistake? If you'll turn with me to Mark 4, 38. And he himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? As the winds howled and the sea raged, the impatient and frightened disciples screamed. They screamed their fear at the sleeping Jesus. Teacher, don't you care that we are about to die? Hey, now I want you to notice Jesus' response. Very important. Now he could have kept on sleeping He could have told him to shut up He could have patiently jumped up And angrily dismissed the storm He could have pointed out their immaturity But he didn't With all the patience That only one who cares can have He answered the question He hushed the storm so that the shivering disciples wouldn't miss his response. Jesus answered once and for all the aching dilemma of man, the question, where is God when I hurt? He's listening, he's healing, that's where he is. He cares, brothers and sisters, but see, the problem is, people try to project on God and onto God what they see in their earthly fathers. Please hear that. See, not until such people forgive their natural fathers can they in fact see God as gentle and kind and loving you see our dirty hearts 
sees God clothed in our parents' mannerisms. God will supply our needs even before we know we have one. So don't let anyone dim your view of God. Our own personal history, our own personal hurts, our own personal failures is a fabric by which we sometimes see God. We sometimes look at God through dark glasses, which darkens the face of God in our eyes. That's why if you read Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You and I had better get rid of our comic book mentality if we're going to go along with God. Because there's an enemy out there that is just lurking. And he's waiting on you. And he's got plenty of time to wait. He's been there a long time. He's the loser of all times. And when he attacks, it's like falling through a manhole of sudden sin. And it happens just that quick. One minute you're walking and singing and laughing and the next minute you are falling because Satan yanks back the manhole cover and an innocent afternoon stroll becomes a Friday the 13th horror story. Helplessly and hopelessly you stumble and you tumble and you fumble and you fall. And you are falling because you are unable to gain control. You are unable to break the fall so you crash at the bottom and stare blankly into the darkness. You inhale the evil stench and sit in Satan's playground until he spits you out and you land dumbfoundedly and shell-shocked back on the sidewalk. This is the pattern of sudden sin. You see, very few sins are premeditated and planned. You see, very few of us would qualify for Satan's strategic team. Now, don't think for one moment that just because you don't want to fall, you won't. Satan has a special trick for you, and he only pulls it out when you're not looking. Satan is a yellow-bellied, counterfeit, fun, garbage, breath-losing maggot of all times. He's the father of lies, and don't fool yourself into thinking that he'll challenge you to a duel or fight you face to face. No, son, no, ma'am, no, brother, no, sister, he's a snake. He hasn't the integrity to tell you to put your fist up and let's go for it. He's a dirty fighter. He's the master of the trap door and of your weak moments. He waits until your defense is down. He waits until your back is turned. He waits until the bell is rang and you're walking back to your corner. Then is when he pulls out his bow, loads it with his dart, aims it at your weakest part, lets the strain go, pow, bullseye. You lose your temper. You lust if you must. You fall. You make the phone call. You buy a bag. You take a drag. You got the torch lit. You take a hit. You buy a drink. Your thoughts stink. Listen, it's not the drinking that has you stinking. It's the stinking thinking that has you drinking. You look at the woman. You rationalize. You forget who you are. You walk into her room. You look out the window. You forget who you are. You say yes. You break your promise. You lie. You covet. You buy the magazine. You stomp your feet. You demand your way. You set yourself up to do it again. You forget who you are. You deny your master. You're like David disrobing Bathsheba. It's like Adam accepting the fruit from Eve. It's Abraham lying about Sarah. It's Noah drunk in his tent and naked. It's Lot in bed with his own daughter. It's Peter denying he ever knew Jesus. It's your worst nightmare. It's sudden. It's sudden sin. It's Satan numbing your awareness and short-circuiting your self-control. We know what we're doing, and yet we can't believe that we're doing it. We know what we're doing is wrong, and yet we are doing it. In the fog of the weaknesses, 
we want to stop but haven't the will to do so. We want to turn around and run but our feet won't move. We want to run and pitifully we want to stay. It's the mother losing her temper. It's the father beating his child. It's the teenager in the back seat. It's the drug addict buying one more fix. It's the alcoholic just buying one drink. It's the boss touching his secretary's shoulder. It's the husband walking into a porn shop. It's the gambler making one more bet. It's the Christian losing control. It is Satan gaining a foothold. Confusion, guilt, rationalization, despair. It all hits, it hits hard. It all hurts, it hurts hard. Now we eventually pick ourselves up and normally stagger back into our world and, oh God, what have I done? I'll never do it again, God. Can you ever forgive me? Listen, brothers and sisters. No one is immune to the tricks of Satan. This demon of hell can scale the highest monastery wall. He can penetrate the deepest faith and invade the purest home. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about and you could preach this message better than I. Some of you, like me, have fallen so many times and have asked for God's forgiveness so often that you wonder and worry that the well of mercy might run dry. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let me help you today. God has given us a message today that's a little different than you normally hear, but I'm going to obey God. I'm talking to you, fathers. I'm talking to you, men. I must ask you, I must ask you, how can you rule your finances? How can you rule your people at your job if you're in an authority position when you can't rule your own spirit? I'm talking about the spirit of anger today. How can you as a man go home and honestly say, I am the head of my household and get other people to respect you when you cannot control yourself. You know, angry spirits will stop the blessing from coming into your life like God wants to send them because you are angry. Anger is a spirit and it's not from God. And it does not matter whether the anger is justified or not. If you don't get it out of you, if you don't get rid of it, it will destroy you. Suppressed rage does terrible things. Got it? Get rid of it. Go to the book of Genesis, if you will. Genesis 49. Genesis 49. Let me get it here. I want to show you something. It's very important for you to know. Here we're talking, uh, Jacob has called around his bed his sons. Let me read it. Then Jacob, Genesis 49, 1. Then Jacob summoned his sons and said, Assembly yourselves that I may tell you what shall befall you in the days to come. I'm going on to verse 7. Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, uncontrolled as water. You shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Reuben didn't fare too good, did he? Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their counsel. Let my glory be united. Let not my glory be united with their assembly. 
Because in their anger, in their anger, in their anger, they slew men. And in their self-will, they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce. And their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Jacob has called around his bed his sons. He has gathered them all around that he might speak to them in in fact, death was coming to take away their father. And he strengthened himself, refusing to die, refusing to die, until he told his sons who they were. <laughs>